Hello. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, this is my eighth trip to Brazil. I keep coming back. I love it so much. So thank you for having me. So this, top, this topic is very close to me because I think that one of the things I was thinking of as we started preparing for this conference was the role of uncertainty and why we believe misinformation or disinformation. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the role that uncertainty plays in this relationship. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what it means to have to survive with uncertain information in uncertain times. How we look at data as a kind of savior. What we can do to either reduce uncertainty by maybe making better choices or make peace with uncertainty by telling better stories. And I'm gonna leave you with a little bit of hope because I feel like that's uh, an important thing to make sure that we hold on to. So when I talk about surviving uncertainty, I mean it quite literally. Many Americans feel really fearful right now. We're in a very polarized kind of time. And the experience that most people talk about when you really ask them what's going on is that they're afraid. This is across both parties, whether it's on the left or the right, this is from a study done by the Pew Research Center. More than being angry and more than being frustrated, both parties feel afraid. And studies have shown that the more we feel fearful towards someone that we perceive as the other, the more likely we are to believe misinformation about them. So these conditions of fear kind of create the circumstances that allow misinformation to spread. This is an amazing book called The Worm at the Core, and it talks about the role of fear in our lives that I highly recommend. But one of the points that the authors make is that the closer our fears are to the surface, the more we cleave to social norms, but not necessarily the social norms of the nation or the social norms of a society, but any group that we identify with. And then when you put all of these things together, the fear, the willingness to believe misinformation about people who are different than you, we get into this kind of fog where we're worn out, where the lines between fact-based reporting and opinionated commentary just blend together. And we don't know what's real, and we don't know what to believe in anymore. And even if you see facts, even if you see evidence, there's this sense that you might not be able to trust what you see. And ultimately, you feel less informed about the world that you're living in. So people do what they can to avoid this kind of circumstance. Uncertainty is so unpleasant to us, people will go to great lengths to avoid it. There was a study that was done about um, last year, I believe, in which over the course of 11 different experiments, they had participants just sit in a room and think. They were given no task. They were asked no questions. The only thing that was available to them was a buzzer in which they could give themselves an electric shock. And most of them preferred to actually give themselves the electric shock than just sit there and do nothing and not know what was expected of them. It is such an uncomfortable position to be in, to not know what's going on, that at least with the shock, you knew what you were getting. This is a great quote by Werner Herzog. He says, if you're after facts, buy the phone book. It has four million times correct facts, but it doesn't illuminate, which is really what we're after. We want facts to support a story, to support a narrative, to support something that makes sense of our world, to illuminate something. So we have data. Data is going to save the day. Data is going to make everything OK. If you type data is into Google, these are the results you get. 
My favorite is data is the new bacon. <laughs> the new oil is beautiful, it's power, it's the new gold, the new currency, it's all these wonderful things. It's gonna save us. We put so much faith in our data. And it has a lot of positive effects. A lot of people, a lot of studies have been done about how people are now monitoring their health through things like Apple Watch or Fitbit. One study showed that after eight months of trying to achieve this goal of walking 10,000 steps a day, we all started counting our steps sometime a few years ago because we were told 10,000 steps was really good for us. 67% of participants did actually increase the amount of effort and activity they expended. They were in better health, they were fitter. Just seeing the data helped them reinforce this positive behavior. But is it always the savior? Is it really the new bacon? 90% of the data that we generate is kind of a mess. It's unstructured. It's dark. And rather than having armies of data scientists, especially in government where I work, we tend to ignore the unstructured data, focus on what we can put in a spreadsheet, and use that to make our decisions. It's not to say that's not valuable, but we're missing a lot. So maybe the thing to think about is not data as a savior, but data all by itself. Just data alone is not going to be our savior. We need something else. This is a lifeboat, in case you couldn't tell. What to do? What's gonna rescue us? So I have two options for you today. One is we find ways to reduce uncertainty with making different kinds of choices, making better choices in our respective roles as journalists, as policymakers, and as scientists. And the other one is to make peace with the uncertainty that we experience. We're not gonna know it all. We're not gonna have all the answers. Data's not gonna save everything. So we have to figure out how to make sure that we can still make sense of our world. And maybe that's through some better stories. So journalists, this is my advice to you. One, help us out. Put that data in context. The New York Times has been doing a tremendous job recently of putting Trump's 17,000 tweets since he became president in context, helping us understand what they all mean, what the kinds of trends and patterns we see emerge so that regular citizens don't have to just feel overwhelmed by the onslaught of the daily Twitter feed. Just explain the data. The idea of the explainer or explanatory journalism has become very popular in the US in the last few years because people are desperate, desperate to understand what's going on in their world. Vox is doing uh, a great job of this kind of model and they take data and just spell it out in plain language. And it makes a big difference to people who are eager to have some sort of fact-based sense of the world, but don't quite get it. They need a little bit of help. And journalists can do a lot just by making it really clear, just by explaining. One last piece of uh, advice is to humanize the data in some way. So this is a piece from The Guardian talking about something that is affecting America very seriously right now, which is mass shootings. And they told the story of some of the survivors. This one's from Columbine. Oops, back. And it makes a big difference to see not just the numbers. We all know the numbers. At least in the US, we know the numbers. There's many, many, many mass shootings and we become numb to the numbers. We become numb to the data. But it's hard to become numb to a human being. So the more we can do to humanize the data, the better that we as a society can understand what to do with it and how to feel less uncertain about where we are. To our scientists, first, make sure that the work that you're doing 
is really impactful, really matters to help address these issues of uncertainty. I'm sure you've all heard of the Nobel Prize. There's also the Ig Nobel Prize, awarded to people who are studying things that are not necessarily breakthroughs for humanity. These were three studies conducted about the effect of eating pizza in Italy. It might protect against it illness only if you eat it in Italy, though. He won the award for having not one, not two, but three papers on this topic. But even if you do study really relevant and useful uh, topics, you have to make sure that people can understand what you're talking about. This is from a report that came out last year. The structure and distribution of an unrecognized interstitium in human tissues. I speak English and I can barely understand what that means. But thanks to Scientific American, I found out that they're actually talking about the discovery of a new organ in our bodies. And since they put pictures and had plain language descriptions of this, I was able to understand that not only is it a new organ, it contains 20% of the fluid in the human body. It's massive. And the potential research that can now be done knowing that this exists is kind of mind-blowing. So scientists think about ways to translate the work that you do into plain language and help reduce the uncertainty that we feel. Finally, so what? This is my least favorite question that a professor always asked me. I'd be very excited about something I had learned. She'd say, but so what? What does it matter? How's it gonna make the world any better? Sometimes you have to spell it out. This was a study that came out in science about racial bias, which didn't really make much of an impact on people until the Washington Post translated the data into something that was impactful, showing that bias in algorithms was actually favoring white patients over sicker black patients. This is the same study, just different wording, and it made a big impact. Policymakers, this is me. I work in government. First, study the problems. Very often in government, we're reacting to problems, but we're not really taking the time to study them. Here's what usually happens. There's a scandal in the news. We get embarrassed because something terrible's happened and we get caught. Here's an instance where children were exposed to lead poisoning in public housing. So what do we do in government? You fire someone. Somebody gets the ax. The next thing you do is you announce, we're gonna make these changes and it's gonna solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem because we never took the time to understand the problem and understand what led to these cases in the first place. So I say to myself and to other people who work in government in the room to take the time to actually look at the data and study the problems. Use it, data, it's great. It's the new bacon. <laughs> Next, make peace with our uncertainty. We're not always going to know what's going on and at some point we're gonna to have to make our peace with it. And one of the ways we do this is by telling ourselves stories about the world. We put things in context. This, this is something that all journalists can do, is not just talk about the scandals and the bad news, but talk about when there's progress being made. Give people some sense of hope. This study from the New York Times showed an instance where journalists and scientists and policymakers pooled their data together and we made some significant progress in studying Alzheimer's disease. This was a TV show called Will and Grace that was very popular about a main character who was gay. And amazingly, researchers discovered that this changed people's minds about gay marriage in America. So pop culture, plus some time, actually changed minds. And highlighting these kinds of things helps people to understand the use of data, the use of these kinds of studies. People have greater rights now than they used to, maybe in part because of some TV show. But we need someone to help us make sense of this. And that's what journalists can do for us. 
This is a documentary that was made about killer whales called Blackfish. And after this documentary came out, SeaWorld, which was an aquarium that had lots of exhibits with killer whales who were being mistreated, had to stop their programs and set their killer whales free. The research that was done, in, that went into this documentary, plus the publicity that came from the documentary, actually changed the practices nationwide of everyone that worked with marine animals. So I think there's hope. All of you being here, this many of you being here, at the end of two days of a long conference, I'm so impressed. It's because you all want to understand how to be better journalists, better data scientists, better policy makers. And I think the thing that we are all here to do is to learn. And that is my closing message to you, is it is the only thing that never fails. This is one of my favorite books that I read as a teenager, The Once and Future King uh, by T.H. White. And in it, it says, the best thing for being sad, here I'll say, the best thing for feeling uncertain is to learn something. It's the only thing that never fails. Learn why the world wags and what wags it. It's the only thing which the mind can never exhaust. So the more we come together and try to learn, the more we can reduce uncertainty, make peace with uncertainty, and hopefully help society find better ways to understand the world that we're in. That's me, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. She is a very inspiring woman, Ela não pediu para fazer isso, mas a Alexis tem um livro que vai ser lançado agora, que está em pré-venda na Amazon. Estou dizendo isso porque, inclusive, é relativo a esse tema, né? The Information Trade. É, como eu sou fã, eu, eu resolvi compartilhar essa informação com vocês. Dê uma olhada que vale a pena.